What is thoracolumbar scoliosis? A diagnosis of scoliosis is typically associated with the area of a spine, meaning thoracic, thoracolumbar, lumbar. So really what's the difference between these lumbar, thoracic, thoracolumbar scoliosis? What does that really mean? So when it comes to scoliosis, we know scoliosis is a sideways curvature of the spine. And a sideways curvature of the spine from the front view, it typically needs to have some rotation associated with it, and the curve needs to be greater than 10 degrees when they use a Cobb angle analysis. Now, the reason why that's important, because in order for it to be initially just be diagnosed as scoliosis in general, it got to be have those components, sideways curvature, 10 degrees or more with rotation. When we look at where the scoliosis is or what area of the spine it is, we know there's three main areas of the spine. We're looking at a cervical, we're looking at a thoracic area, and we're looking at a lumbar, meaning neck, mid-back, low back. And the cervical, thoracic, lumbar areas help classify the scoliosis. A thoracic scoliosis is the most common, but the truth is scoliosis can develop in any area of the spine, and patients can have multiple curvatures. They can have more than one, they can have two, three, four, five curvatures. In fact, most patients have three or more, because if you have less than that, you don't come back to neutral, which makes sense when if you look at the scoliosis x-rays that are happening. However, most patients are just told wherever the biggest curve is. So they're going to say you have a thoracic scoliosis. Even though you may have a, a thoracic and a lumbar, they're just going to tell you typically where your biggest curve is. Understanding how the, how the condition is classified is also important, meaning many times the diagnosis will be associated with the patient's age, meaning infantile scoliosis, adolescent scoliosis, um, juvenile scoliosis or adult scoliosis. So age is typically their condition type, whether it's idiopathic scoliosis, congenital scoliosis, or neuromuscular scoliosis. Congenital scoliosis is when a patient has a malformed bone in the spine, meaning something called a hemivertebra, which will cause a scoliosis to occur because the bone is not shaped like a rectangle like every other bone and will cause a curvature to occur. Neuromuscular scoliosis is when a patient has a neuromuscular condition, and these neuromuscular conditions typically affect the connective tissue of the body, meaning the ligaments or the soft tissues or the muscles, something like Marfan's, Ehlers Downer syndrome, neurofibromatosis, and this neuromuscular scoliosis, this condition can cause a scoliosis from occurring. Again, that's another five or ten percent of cases, and then about eighty or so percent of cases are something called idiopathic. Idiopathic scoliosis is when we have no idea what causes it. It's called unknown cause, and that's what idiopathic is. Most people believe idiopathic scoliosis is a result of multifactorial conditions that can lead to a curve developing during child. And in the adult stage, the most common type is degenerative scoliosis. Degenerative scoliosis is a result of spinal misalignment, which leads to degeneration over time, which can lead to scoliosis developing. So we have age of patient, we have the type of scoliosis, and then we have severity, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. Mild curvatures are less than 25 degrees. Between 20 and 25 and 40, we call it a moderate scoliosis, and anything greater than 40 is called severe. So we have like infantile, neuromuscular, mild or moderate or severe. And then the last thing would be location. Location would be where the curve is actually located, whether it's a thoracic scoliosis, whether it's a lumbar scoliosis, or whether it's a thoracolumbar, cervical, when typically they're naming it by the largest curve, okay? Now the curve location is dictated by where the most horizontal bone is in the curvature, which I'll explain in a second. The reason why these classifications exist because it helps us uh, uh, find out which treatment options work best for which type of condition, meaning once it's all classified, what works best for neuromuscular infantile scoliosis that are severe in nature in, the, in a thoracic spine or versus an adolescent scoliosis as a thoracolumbar that's a moderate in nature. It helps us design treatment guidelines and treatment plans to give the very best option. So clear classification of scoliosis is important for your treatment and it's definitely best understood by with normally a x-ray. Normally x-rays are taken to find the severity, we know the age, and we also know the curve type, and we also know, you know the location. The only thing that we normally don't get off x-ray is if there is an underlying neuromuscular condition, but normally the patient will have other symptoms, other problems going on, will help us determine what tests that we need to order to determine what type of neuromuscular condition they can have, and, and there, therefore that will help us rule out neuromuscular alignments or neuromuscular conditions as a result of the scoliosis. That's then we've done outside of an x-ray. But with x-ray, we, we can get everything else. So a thoracolumbar scoliosis specifically states that the scoliosis is occurring 
in the thoracolumbar area. And the reason why there's two areas is because it's occurring right between. When we look at the thoracic spine, we know there's 12 vertebra. It goes from thoracic spine uh, vertebra number one, or T1, down to thoracic spine uh, vertebra number 12, which is called T12. Then your lumbar section starts from L1 to L5, right? And the thoracolumbar typically means the apex of the curve, where the curve occurs and the most horizontal bone, or the biggest area of the curve, or the most deviation occurs, right at the thoracolumbar area, T12, L1, or T12 L1 disc. It's in those two bones is where the apex of the curve will be. Now you're diagnosed with a thoracolumbar scoliosis. Now, interesting enough, thoracolumbar curves tend to be very visual because they're occurring right in this area. So you tend to see a lot of translation or a lot of movement, a lot of asymmetry, asymmetry right here in the transition between your waist and your ribs. Also, they tend to be very longer swooping curves that go up into the thoracic spine. So they tend to be very asymmetrical. You tend to have a bigger thoracolumbar curve and then a small counter curve up in the upper thoracic spine. I find thoracolumbar uh, curves respond very, very well to conservative care because of this asymmetrical nature. This asymmetrical nature of the thoracolumbar curve tends to provide a very good response to our conservative treatment options. And also, the thoracolumbar area, this transition area, tends to be the most mobile, meaning it moves well under our conservative approaches. So we have very good re re results with thoracolumbar curvatures. So we definitely recommend that if you have a thoracolumbar spine, a scoliosis in this specific area of the spine, that you seek out some type of conservative treatment before surgery tends to be your before you get a surgical recommendation. And if you have one, you may be able to respond to conservative treatment to get the curve under surgical levels because th these curves tend to respond very, very well. So bottom line is if you're diagnosed with a thoracolumbar scoliosis, that means that your, your apex of the curve is in the thoracolumbar area, the transition between the thoracic spine and the lumbar spine. These curves tend to be asymmetrical. They tend to be very postural dominant. You can see this postural deviation very strongly but most positively, they respond very well to proactive treatment, especially conservative treatment offered here in Scoliosis Reduction Center. So I recommend you're proactive towards it. Look to see if you can qualify for treatment and, and prevent yourself from having a surgical recommendation. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this information helpful. If you'd like to hear about other topics and information on scoliosis, type in the comments below and let us know. And finally, subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of when we publish content. Thanks.